everybody. Welcome to History of Life podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. James David Odling, and we're going to be talking about his book, The Writings of John the Presbyter. It's available on Amazon and other sites for purchasing. No relevant links will be in the description below. So that being said, welcome to History of Life podcast, Dr. Odling. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be with you and the guests. Could you describe John the Presbyter for those that never have heard of him? Certainly, it'd be a pleasure. Okay, the problem is uh, twofold. Modern scholars believe that there is virtually nothing known about him. But actually, if we dig deep enough into the early writers, we do find a good amount of material about him. The problem with ancient writers is, at which still conflicts us today, is that there was a great deal of confusion between the various Johns. There's John the Presbyter, there's John the Evangel, uh, the John of Patmos, there's uh, John the Disciple, and these were often confused, especially by an author called Eusebius, who wrote an early church history. So it takes a certain amount of disentangling. John the Presbyter, as opposed to the others, was uh, born into a well-connected, wealthy, and powerful family in Jerusalem. And uh, he was married rather early in his life to a daughter of Annas, who was for a while the high priest. And even after he was removed from that office, several of his sons continued on making a kind of dynasty, you could say, of high priests. And because of this marriage to his daughter, whose name was Anna, after her father, he was amongst those selected for a quality education, which he apparently, I'm not positive of this, but I believe that he had it in what was then the finest university in the West, <clears throat> excuse me, the Mausaian in Alexandria, Egypt, where one of the most important professors was Philo of Alexandria, well known in Judaism because he is an early essayist who strove to accommodate the philosophy of Moses with the philosophy of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And uh, he introduced much more widely than Heraclitus had previously the word logos, which of course we know very well begins the Gospel of John. Uh, John the Presbyter was apparently given a very fine position. We know from uh, early writings that he wore what was called the petalon in Greek, which is part of the sacred vestments of the high priests. Of course, he's not in the list of high priests in this time period. So the assumption can be made that he was a Sagan, which is the, you might say, the number two guy in the temple. He was in charge of deploying the priests to their various uh, 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 work assignments. And uh, when the high priest, who at this time was, of course, the well-known, famous Caiaphas, when he was unavailable, he could take over uh, with the sacred duties of sacrifice or on Yom Kippur entering into the Hashirim, the uh, sacred holy of holies. And uh, if, as a part of his work, he was sent with a junket of of Pharisees, priests, and Sadducees into Galilee, and that was to investigate the possibility that the man we know today as John the Baptist, I prefer to say John the Immerser, which is a translation rather than transliteration, that John the Immerser might possibly be the expected Messiah. John the Immerser denied that claim according to the beginning of the Gospel of John, and instead said, I think I have the candidate you should have in mind. And that was Yeshua, as is pronounced in Aramaic, Jesus in English. And uh, this encounter led to several more encounters, especially in Jerusalem. And John the Presbyter was more and more convinced that this individual was indeed the expected Messiah or Mashiach. And so eventually he left his position in the temple and became one of the last to join disciples of Jesus, not long before his execution. After the life of Jesus and the continuing troubles of insurrections, civil wars in Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside, he went for a quieter life in Ephesus, where he became the 
major domo, you could say, of a group of seven congregations that were concentrating on keeping alive the teachings of Jesus, this expected Messiah. And during that time, he uh, was part of a, an assembly of leaders of this movement. I'm not calling it Christianity because that's something later and quite different. This movement came together in Ephesus to make some serious decisions. And amongst those was that they were, the elders urged John the Presbyter to write an account of the eyewitness memories of Jesus combining not only his own personal memories, because he had gotten to know Jesus quite well, but also the memories of the individual who is most often called today the beloved disciple, because that individual was about to leave for an extended trip through Rome and Gaul and on. This led to John's writing several uh, pages of drafts in the Aramaic language, which was, of course, his first language. And Eventually, he was arrested and deported, uh, exiled, I should say, to the island of Patmos for a period of time. And these precious texts that he had written were sent for safekeeping to Sinope in the province of, of uh, Pontus, which is on the south shore of the Black Sea, today in central Turkey. And there they remained. He did not know where they were. For all he knew, they had been lost, destroyed. And something like 20 years later, a young fellow named Marcion knocked on the door and said, here's your manuscripts. And by this time, John was in his 90s. He was incapable, really, of doing any further work to complete the gospel. So it fell to one of his two most uh, expert students, a man named Papias of Hierapolis, to complete this gospel. And Papias did so by translating it into Greek and reorganizing the pages of this draft into a proper order and putting a few bridge texts here and there to make it a complete narrative. That's the beginning of what we now know as the Gospel of John. John had also, after returning from his exile, during which he had a powerful vision over a series of nights around the time of Pesach, Passover, and that became later written up as the book of the Revelation. He also, in these later years, wrote a number of letters. There are three that have been saved for us in the New Testament, the Christian scriptures. And there are three more of which I've found fragments. And I have those translated in the book you just showed. And also in this period of time, he wrote one last major book length work called The Songs of the United One, which essentially is 42 poems of exquisite beauty in Aramaic. When I read it in the Aramaic, I am not joking. I, it literally brings tears to my eyes. It's such beautiful poetry. And it consists of a dialogue between Jesus and the beloved disciple in front of the tomb on the morning of resurrection. The profundity and the exquisite writing is simply unparalleled until the time of Ephraim of Syria, the other great poet of this general time period. And John then, uh, in his 90s, finally succumbed. He was the only disciple, so far as I know, who died of natural causes, and he lived a very long life. So that, in a nutshell, is what can be pieced together about the life of John the Presbyter. When do you think the Gospel of John was published? Are, are we talking about, obviously, some point in the second century when Pavius is active? No, it, it was published probably just before the turn of the, of the first century into the second. The drafts that I mentioned began to come together in the year 42. That was when that council that I mentioned was held. And they ceased in the year 68, which is when John was arrested and exiled to Patmos. And then in the 90s, they were put together, as I, as I mentioned, by Papias, and put into an organized whole in Greek, out of the original language of Aramaic. And that then would have been published in the 90s. So that's what led to a certain amount of confusion in both early writers as well as modern writers, how it seems that John is one of the later of the canonical gospels. Some, many of them, many people say it's the very latest. And yet at the same time, 
a number of internal clues, such as the description of where the walls are around the city of Jerusalem and the mentioning of edifices that were not at the time he wrote destroyed, tells us that it was probably an early text. So that answers that question. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what purpose did John the Presbyter see in writing his works? And yeah, I already asked you when he wrote it. So uh, yeah, what, what was the purpose? The purpose was very simple. The beloved disciple, as with anyone, was mortal and would not live forever. And so this precious eyewitness account would not live past her life unless, of course, it were put on paper. So he intended that the gospel would be, in effect, the parakletos, the paraclete, we generally say in English, the promised presence of a guide, a teacher, who would remind all of the followers of Jesus' teachings exactly what Jesus taught, no different, no less. And so minus the beloved disciple who, as I mentioned, was about to leave on an extended journey into Europe, this text then was intended to take her place to give us a sense of what Jesus' actual teachings were. The essentiality of this was that there was another individual also claiming to have the original, true, and real teachings of Jesus. And his name was no, is known in English as Paul of Tarsus. And while Paul never met Jesus, uh, his teaching was rather revisionist of what actually Jesus taught. Twice there were encounters with the actual disciples of Jesus in Jerusalem, and both times they basically said to Paul, tone it down because you're not teaching what our master taught. So the Gospel of John was also basically meant to counteract and correct the misapprehensions of some others as to what Jesus taught. Is John the Pres Presbyterian a member of the Johannine School? You, you could call him the founder of the Johannine School. The Johannine refers to him. His, his name pronounced in Aramaic is Yocham, and we say John in English. The German speakers have it a little bit more correctly by saying Johann, but it's Johann, and he was the founder, you could say, of his school. It's my wife's telephone. I didn't realize you were here. One moment. Okay, my apologies. Oh, no problem. How would you compare John the Presbyter? to the other John, such as John of Patmos or John the Apostle. Okay. John the Apostle and his brother James were the sons of a man known as Zebedee. They were Galilean fishermen. Uh, they were, according to several sources, executed rather early by the Romans. And they don't seem to have been likely to have, a, have had a strong education such as John the Presbyter. So the possibility of their writing a gospel really cannot be considered. Eusebius, as I think I mentioned before, was rather confused on this point. So I'm trying to differentiate these two, John the son of Zebedee from John the Presbyter. John of Patmos is the same individual as far as I'm concerned. That is a minority view. I think the majority of scholars today would say that they were two different people, that the differences between the book of Revelation and the gospel of John are too extreme. I myself, besides doing my scholarly work, am also a novelist. I've written quite a few novels, and I can easily imagine in some future century, someone might say, well, the novels by someone named James David Audlin are quite different from the nonfiction. So obviously they must have been two different people. Well, I'm here to tell you, I'm just me. But that possibility helps us to see how John the Presbyter and John the Pat, uh, John of Patmos, while often differentiated by scholars, in my view, are the same. There is a great deal of commonal commonality between the revolution, revelation and the gospel. Themes, terminology, especially when we turn to the Aramaic original, which is preserved for us in a text called the Crawford Codex. Do you think he wrote the three letters of John found in the New Testament? Yes, I do. The first letter 
seems to have been written shortly before his arrest in the year 68. I find it fascinating that it ends with a broken sentence, an incomplete sentence in the Greek. And uh, that suggests to me that he was feverishly writing what he could as fast as he could. I, that's just my imagination, but it certainly does look that way. And the second letter is written to the elected woman. The Greek suggests ho elect electa signif uh, signifies a woman who was chosen, who was elected. This individual, I believe, is that aforementioned beloved disciple. And it's basically written to warn about those who might try to inculcate their way into her life in order to gain access to her privileged, privileged wisdom about Jesus. And the third letter was written because of a crisis in the seven congregations in Anatolia, which is Western Turkey today, in which there was a man named Diotrephes who was apparently trying to steer these seven congregations away from the teachings of John, the Johannine school that you mentioned, and into the school of Paul of Tarsus. And John wrote this letter evidently to try to counteract that and urge people to stay with the original true teachings. And as I mentioned, there are three other letters that I'm aware of, which we have only fragments, but they're precious fragments because they are from this individual. Would you equate John the Presbyter with John the Pillar mentioned by Paul in his letters? Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is a pun in Greek. Mm -hmm. Stilos. Pillar is one meaning, but it but it also su suggests a rather disparaging characteristic. He's basically insulting John subtly, and uh, expressing his 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 disgust and fu fury. John the Presbyter is the Pharisee who is mentioned in the early going of Acts as opposing the acceptance of Paul into the uh, group of disciples. And Paul seems to have held that against John the rest of his life. A number of the letters, especially Colossians, when you read them carefully, are pretty evidently riddled with diatribes against John the Presbyter. So there was no joy between the two of them, unfortunately. And <clears throat> he uh, sought in these letters and other means to try to keep a distance from uh, his followers uh, against Paul. Again, in the Revelation, as I'm sure you're aware, Jacob, there are seven letters written to the seven congregations in Anatolia. And there are quite a few references therein about being uh, mesmerized, you might say, by the, by the Pauline tradition. And John in these letters is urging the followers not to do so. Do you think, oh, actually... I almost skipped the question there. For a moment, I'd like to go off topic to ask you a question regarding a different book that you did on John, which is titled The Gospel of John, the Original Version. In page mm -hmm. 226, you mention Professor Robert Eisenman and its argument that Paul was related to the Herodian dynasty. Since you have discussed this, could you tell the audience if you think that Paul was actually related to the Herods? Yeah, sure. Just a bit of background for those who aren't familiar. The term Herodians refers to the power center, you might say, in the temple bureaucracy or hierarchy in the late Second Temple period. Uh, these were individuals associated with Herod the Great, Herod the First, who was king in the years leading up to the Common Era, about a generation or two before Jesus. And the Herodians had control of the temple and basically, as I suggested earlier, appointed people whom they thought would be supportive of them and work along with them to maintain their power base. So Paul himself was from a Tarsian family, evidently of Edomite ancestry, which is a non-Israelite Semitic group. And they claimed to be Jews, although it's rather difficult to see how they were Jews in practice, although they may indeed have had some Jewish ancestry and held to some extent to traditions. How much of that we don't know. His name Saul in Hebrew, 
uh, which of course we associate with the first king uh, back in the time of the uh, kings of Judah. His name apparently in the family was Paulus, in our letters, P-A-U-L-U-S. It's a word that still survives in the Persian language today. And it means deceiver or flatterer. It's very interesting that he had this name, Paulus, as he grew up. But after a confrontation in Crete with the Roman governor, whose name happened to be Sergius Paulus, he decided he'd adopt that name for his own because Paulus in Latin, as I'm sure you know, means short. It doesn't really have any signification of flattery or of deceiving. So he embraced the name that he had been beset with for most of his life. Paul, as a Tarsian, had no immediate connection, but when he came to, to Jerusalem in his youth, he studied for a period of time with Gamaliel. This is Gamaliel I, the grandson of Hillel the Great, Gamaliel, who was often referred to as our master. He was the Nasi, the president of the Sanhedrin, a man to be reckoned with, a man who was friendly with Jesus, was friendly with John the Presbyter. Paul studied with him, but there are some suggestions in the Torah that Gamaliel, who was of a patience that was proverbial, eventually got sick of Paul's upstart style of questioning, twisting things around, and effectively threw him out of class. And uh, Paul continued, however, to try to inculcate himself into the Jewish hierarchy without much success. At the same time, he saw the early followers of Jesus as competition. And eventually, he seemed to have the decision come to him that if you can't beat them, join them. The vision that he supposedly had on the road of Damascus, uh, this is going to cause some people to have uh, anxiety attacks, but I'll go ahead anyway. Even in ancient times, it was questioned by quite a few whether that vision actually happened or whether it was conveniently invented. He tells the vision three times in the book of Acts, and it's fascinating how the details change every time. Sometimes the companions of Paul on the road to Damascus see something but hear nothing. Other times they hear something but see nothing. The story apparently changed according to the audience. So Paul was, you might say, something of a chameleon. He wasn't making any headway amongst the Judahites, the Judeans, and so he evidently went to the diaspora and also to the, the Gentiles, the larger Roman Empire, selling his version of Jesus Christ he called him Christ as if that was his name. Christos in Greek is simply a literal translation of Mashiach, anointed one. He took that to the Gentile population and had an astonishing, overwhelming success. And the organized religion Christianity that we have today is largely descended from Paul's original seeding. And the Johannine tradition did for a while persist especially in outlying regions of the empire, such as the British Isles, parts of France, uh, also in, in rural regions of Italy. <clears throat> and these actually survived until the Middle Ages. The last congregation of which I'm aware that still survived was in Wales, and it was finally forcibly put out of business in the 1200s. There was genocide through this period. There's no other word that really covers it. One of the crusades was taken up against the Bogomils and the Cathars in order to destroy them because they were a very successful competition to the established Christian organization that was teaching traditions that were far more closely related to the Johannine school. So once again, as I said before, there was a disconnect between John's teachings of what Jesus was and taught, and Paul's teachings of what Jesus was and taught. Eventually, Paul, well past his life, won the battle, and that's why, as I said, the organized religion today is essentially Pauline. So you don't think that he was directly related to the Herods? Paul, no. Mm. No. Do you think 
uh, based on Papius's quotation of John the Presbyter regarding the Gospel of Mark, that he was uh, saying that Mark's Gospel came first in, this, in the synoptic tradition, just as modern, modern scholars do. That's one of those balls that gets kicked around the court quite a bit by scholars. Get three of them together, you'll have at least five opinions. Mark, the Gospel of Mark, according to a fascinating letter which Morton Smith found in, in Marsaba in the uh, 1950s, suggests to us that there were three drafts of the Gospel of Mark. John Mark had been as, as assigned to Peter, as we know him today in English, or Simon the, Simon the uh, Apostle, Shimon became Petros in Greek, uh, he was assigned to him as an assistant and also as a note taker because Simon or Peter, if you prefer, he would reminisce to his audiences, to his students. He would say, oh, I remember the day when Jesus said this, or I remember the day when Jesus did that. And John Mark would quickly write these notes down. Later, after Simon had been executed, he assembled these into a, an early draft of the Gospel of Mark. Later, uh, he came upon a draft of a gospel that Simon wrote, uh, which we still have some small portions of today called, it's usually called the Gospel of Peter. <clears throat> and these and some other uh, materials were assembled into a second draft of the Gospel of Mark. This draft was later redacted in order to make it conform more closely to what was becoming the organized religion's dogma. And that's the version that we have in the canonical New Testament today. However, this letter that I mentioned that Morton Smith found goes on to say there was a third draft, which Smith calls the secret gospel of Mark. Smith was, as a by the way, horribly attacked for this by some of my colleagues. They made all sorts of horrible ad hominem attacks on Smith for this, accused him of forging the letter, accused him of using it as an excuse for uh, uh, aiding and abetting his supposed homosexual nature, which actually wasn't the case, not that there's anything wrong with being homosexual, but they accused him of that. They accused him of forgery. And these people published books which were bestsellers. They should be ashamed of themselves. The manuscript was later found, photographed. I've looked at the photographs of it. It was transcribed, it has been studied, and yet these people have not retracted these attacks on Smith. But getting back to what the letter from Clement says that Smith found, there was this third draft, which according to John Mark was intended only for the most advanced students in the spiritual tradition. So it included uh, in, information and events and descriptions that were part of those Aramaic drafts of John the Presbyter that I mentioned earlier. So there's surprising amount of parallel in the two sections that we have of the secret gospel that Clement quoted between uh, that sacred gospel of Mark and the gospel of John as we have it, especially the scene of the death and resuscitation of Lazarus. And so John Mark evidently put his gospel together approximately the same time as John was writing these drafts and uh, they shared with each other. John, the presbyter later on wrote a, you might say a, a critical review of the gospel of John, of uh, the gospel of Mark. And uh, they were friends more like a teacher and student because the difference in age was considerable. John Mark was not born until just after the death of Jesus. However, I might quickly note that there was an earlier gospel evidently written. I was asked by a French scholar about a manuscript that purports to be written by Pontius Pilate in the year 37. And I read it expecting it to be garbage, expecting it to be some kind of ancient forgery. But so many details checked out that while I'm not 100% sure, I am frankly leaning toward the very real possibility that's by Pontius Pilate. I mentioned this text written in 37 because at one point he mentions his wife, whose name was Procola, with a woman named Mary, copying by hand the Gospel of Thomas so that they might share it with students in the tradition of 
the teachings of Jesus. So if this is so, and I'm emphasizing the word if, then there is that possibility that the Gospel of Thomas was written by the year, before the year 37, which is astonishingly early and earlier than any other. For those who aren't aware, the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of sayings of John. It is not a narrative gospel. It has nothing that Jesus did. It doesn't tell a story. It simply has Jesus said this, Jesus said that, Jesus said the other thing. Nevertheless, it is a fascinating work. I am in regular contact with a with the leading Gospel of Thomas scholar, Martin Linsen in the Netherlands because of our common interest in this very early and very interesting gospel. Some scholars, not many, but some appear to think that the Gospel of Thomas is the Q document, rather than a different version or a different version of it. What do you what do you think of that? I don't think so. Uh, first of all, the for those who don't know, the Q document that Jacob is mentioning is a hypothetical document. It's never been found, and I don't believe it ever will be found. It refers to those texts that are common to the Gospel of Matthew and Luke that are pretty much the same in both of those two later Gospels, but which are not found in the Gospel of Mark. Matthew and Luke have a great deal of material that they borrowed from Mark, and they also have a certain amount of material in common. And that material that they have in common is what is called Q. For those who wonder why the letter Q, it stands for the German word Quelle, which means source. So it's a source called source, you could say. Now, what was Q? My belief is that it was material taken from what I just mentioned earlier, the secret gospel of Mark, which Clement of Alexandria refers to in that letter that Morton Smith found. So all of this starts to hang together if, you, if you're following me. The secret gospel of Mark then was the source for a great deal of material in Matthew and Luke. I don't think Q is entirely from the secret gospel, but I think a good deal of it is, especially in the scenes after the resurrection. These seem to be taken, especially in Matthew, almost directly from what I infer is the secret gospel of Mark version. When would you date the other free gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke? Okay, Mark, as I suggested before, roughly contemporaneous in the second version, the second text that John Mark wrote with the Aramaic drafts of the Gospel of John, which means between the 40s and the 60s. According to the Coptic Christian Church, uh, which kept very good early records, John Mark was assassinated by a mob in Alexandria, Egypt, probably in the year 67, 66, 70, 67 in that area. So obviously he didn't do much work on the gospel after that point. Now, John, as I suggested, was drafted in Aramaic between the years 42 and 68 by my analysis of the situation, later by Papias of Heropolis put into the Greek form in the 90s. Around that same time, Matthew and Luke were coming together. I find a very interesting uh, recent suggestion uh, that uh, Luke Acts, which really is a single work in two parts, Luke and Acts together, one book, part one, part two, was written by a woman and put together probably in the late 90s or very early in the second century. Matthew, I suggest, was a smidge earlier it's more obviously based on that secret gospel of Mark, the Mark Markan material. Yet both Mark, excuse me, both Matthew and Luke also have a certain amount of Johannine material directly from the Gospel of John. So they are the latest. They are basically, to borrow the French word, a potpourri. They are a mixture of material from various sources that they collated together as best they can. The author of Luke actually says so in the opening verses of the gospel. So if you want it in order, Thomas is the earliest, then the gospel of John in its original Aramaic and Mark around the same time in the roughly in the middle of the first century, Matthew and Luke at the end of the line. 
Other extremely important gospels, non-canonical, they were not selected by the Pauline religion for inclusion in the New Testament, but also extremely important, include the Gospel of Philip, which was written by a close friend and neighbor of John. Uh, John was in Ephesus and Philip was down the road. And uh, Philip, like John, was a disciple. He's actually mentioned, I, th it's, I think it's chapter 23 of Acts, it mentions Philip the evangelist. So that is also an important text because it is essentially a theological reflection on the contents of the Gospel of John. So it's extremely helpful. And there are other very important Gospels as well that were not selected. But just because later the organized religion selected a Gospel as canon and others not, doesn't mean that we should look only at the canonical Gospels and ignore the others. They're all a part of what we need to study as best we can in order to ascertain and clarify in our minds the origins and the early history of what we now know as Christianity. So basically, in, in your view, you think that Matthew and Luke used an, an earlier version of John's gospel as a source? Indirectly, mm. through the third and last of John Mark's uh, versions of the Gospel of Mark, the one that Morton Smith calls the secret Gospel of Mark. Yeah, but, uh, uh, did John Mark finish his Gospel in the 60s or did someone else finish it for him after he died? The second version, he clearly finished, uh, but it was redacted by someone later on, as I suggested, to make it conform to the dogma of the growing Pauline organization, which became Christianity. The question usually asks is, what happened to the end? The Gospel of Mark ends with the women entering the tomb and being terrified, scared out of their wits, and hmm. running like crazy to get out of there, and saying to themselves, we're not telling anybody what we saw about that angel in the tomb. It's, it ends like that, and there's no more. Yet, you can see by logic, Jacob, that if there was a later version of the Gospel of Mark, the so-called secret Gospel, then clearly Mark had to finish the second Gospel, which we now know as the canonical version, because he wouldn't go on to write a third version without finishing the second. So I think it's a safe assumption that it was finished. I think that that ending was removed because it partook too much of the Johannine theology, which was being suppressed in the early organized religion, that Jesus, after his resurrection, uh, did not live for 40 days, as the Gospel of Luke and Acts suggest, but that he expired after only a few hours of recovering his consciousness three days after the execution, and that his spirit was entered into the body of the beloved disciple, Mary, and that thereafter they were unified in the image and the likeness of Elohim. If you recall in Genesis 1, chapter, uh, verses 26 and 27, Elohim, which is the northern Israelite name for God, Elohim says we will create the human in our own image and likeness, and that human first created is by a very careful analysis of the Hebrew, which I have in the book you mentioned, an androgyne, male and female as one. So that's essentially what, according to the Johannine school, happened at the resurrection. That, I believe, was how the Gospel of Mark concluded, and that's why I believe it was taken out. But we have some hints of that in the Gospel of Matthew, which I've, I've sorted out in that book that you mentioned, and also the Gospel of John, once it has been recovered from the editing, the redacting that was done by the early religion to that Gospel as well to make it fit to the dogma. I'm doing that latter work by reading early Galilean texts of the Gospel of John that escaped a great deal of the redaction that had gone on in the Greek text. So the book you mentioned, there's soon going to be a third edition It'll be in eight volumes. We're, don't worry, folks. We're keeping the price as low as we can. But uh, that eight volumes will cover exactly how the Gospel of John was originally intended to be published, but wasn't. 
because Papias of Heropolis was making it conform to a large degree to the Pauline dogma, and then later red actors continued that work. So I'm doing my best to bring it back to its original state. Do you, do you do this by looking at the different manuscripts of John's gospel? Yes, yes. I read fluently, obviously, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic, other languages that I have to use quite often include Coptic and Georgian, not not the Georgian that not the Georgia Ray Charles was hankering for, but rather the country in way Eastern Europe in the Caucasus Mountains, as well as in Amharic or uh, Ge'ez, which is a Semitic language in Ethiopia. In these languages that I just mentioned, there are very early texts of the Gospel of John, as well as other Gospels, that need to be studied closely. About eight years ago, I think it was, I stumbled by accident upon the existence of what of some manuscripts that are known as the Palestinian lectionaries. These Palestinian lectionaries contain a text of the Gospel of John that is astonishingly different from what is called the Textus Receptus, the Gospel of John in Greek. And all of you who are familiar with the Gospel of John, the translations that you read are based on that Greek version, which, as I said, was heavily redacted. These Galilean texts in the Palestinian lectionaries, as well as other early codices that I have access to, that also, I can say, it escaped these redactions, escaped these excisions, escaped these interpolations, and represent a much more archaic form of the Gospel of John. These are what I mainly work with. But as I suggested, I also work with other languages as well. Ephraim the Syrian, who was an early church father in the East, writing exclusively in Aramaic in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the fourth century, he quotes from the Gospel of John quite often, verbatim, but his verbatim quotations are, once again, astonishingly different from the Greek. So with sources such as these, I'm able to do the best I can to try to piece together what John the Presbyter intended his gospel to be like, but he was not able to do so. As I said, he was arrested, deported, the manuscript sent away, later came back when he was far too old to do much about it. So I'm trying to redo the work 2,000 years later that he was unable to complete. I wanted to go back to the Gospel of Thomas for a moment. Sure. You think that's the earliest text dating to the late 1830s, do you think I, I lean that way? As I said, I'm not 100% sure that this pilot manuscript is really by pilot. It does look that way. The issue is that we don't have the original manuscript. We All we have today is a translation into French that was done evidently in the late 19th century that somebody in roughly the 1930s typed up as a transcript. So we have those two texts, and these were published in a, a self-published edition that I found by accident just after this uh, scholar in France, Max Guy is his name, contacted me and said, que pensez-vous de cette manuscrit? And I said, well, let me take a look at it. And I found fascinating details that have only been discovered very recently. So the chance that, that this is a relatively modern forgery are pretty small because forgers don't generally do that amount of research to find so many facts and get so many things absolutely correct. So I lean that way, Jacob, but I'm not 100% sure. I So I tend to think, yes, that Thomas may be our first gospel. Assuming that it is, mm -hmm. do you think that Jesus said everything in there that it alleged that he said, or do you think some of it is questionable? In the gospel of Thomas or in general? Yeah, Thomas. Thomas. That's a that's a tricky question. I think probably most of it, possibly all of it, is accurate. There are certainly some extremely challenging uh, statements in the Gospel of Thomas. This is something that Martin Linsen, the Netherlandish scholar that I mentioned, he and I discuss this all the time. Uh, often we bat our heads because his view and my view aren't quite harmonious, but we love talking with each other because it gets our juices flowing to, to interpret what exactly is going on in the Gospel of Thomas. It's a fascinating text, and it definitely is not Pauline 
got a super chat question from Paul Kickling. Thank you for the five pounds. This suggests that uh, the Johannine lineage is more Gnostic, which is ironic since Irenaeus is from the Johannine uh, line through Polycarp, androgyny spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes, Paul, I, I, I would basically agree with you. Just a caveat, the word Gnostic, Gnosticism, is often overused, including by scholars who should know better. Uh, it's applied to a wide range of things without really thinking about what Gnosticism is. Gnosticism was not an, a spiritual tradition. It was a, just a movement, a philosophical movement. We find aspects of it in Judaism. We find aspects of it in what became Christianity. And we find aspects of it in Gentile philosophy as well. It is generally of the view that there is a good world and a not so good world. The good world is created by the good God and the not so good world, which is this physical realm in which we live, is the creation of a demiurge, a God who is less than good. And oftentimes, especially in Valentinian Gnosticism, it suggests that the serpent back there in chapter two and three of, of the book of Genesis was trying to help Adam and Eve realize that this demiurge was fooling them and that they needed to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil so that their eyes would be opened to exactly how they were being misused and misinformed by the demiurge. It's quite a different perspective from the standard Jewish and for that matter, the standard Christian understanding of Genesis. So, Gnosticism isn't really the case with, with John the Presbyter in his writings. Uh, John did not see this world as contingent or as evil or as poorly created as did Valentinius, the best known school of Gnosticism. He sees this world, John the Presbyter, sees this world as good, as beautiful, and where there is evil, it's not by God's intention, but it's by the misdeeds of humanity because humanity was given free will. And we can, of course, use that free will for good or evil. So John was striving in his gospel and his other writings to say, we must therefore choose the good. So I wouldn't call it quite Gnostic. Uh, it tends to be scholars call Gnostic anything that isn't orthodox dogma according to Christianity today. And I, I resist that. There are differences and we have to be very careful about how we use the words. We have another super chat. Um, it's Paul again. Thank you for another five pounds. I'm Georgian. Any way you can send me any Georgian Christian writings or make them available or any language for that matter? Sure. <laughs> I've got Georgian texts uh, that I think you would find uh, fascinating. I, I, I assume you read the language. It's a beautiful language. I'm still learning it. This has been a relatively new language in my life. Fascinating, gorgeous language. Uh, if you can send me your email address through, uh, through Jacob, I can send you some texts that you might find interesting. Well, on one, thank you for the $20. So, uh, going back to the Q document, do you sure. think, so, so you think a bit of the, of the material that's understood as Q comes from secret mark. Do you think pieces of it could also have come from Thomas? I don't think so. It's, of course, anything is possible. My time machine is in the shop, so I'm not able to go back and find out for sure. But I tend not to think so. There are a number of, of, <coughs> of Logia. Uh, a Logian is one of these single Jesus said things in the Gospel of Thomas. There are a number of Logia that are more or less similar to to uh, teachings of Jesus that we have in the canonical gospels. So there are connections, uh, but whether they were in the secret gospel or not, we can only hypothesize because we have very little that is certifiably from the secret gospel. Other texts that we can infer may have been from the secret gospel, we don't know. So I uh, probably a few things, but not an awful lot. There seems to be a, a separate uh, family tree, you might say, with the Gospel of Thomas and the Marka material. The Marka material does have an overlap with the Johannine material, but I'm not sure that there's much with the Thomasine. Hmm. When you look at uh, 
the Eastern uh, uh, traditions regarding these texts. Um, what would you say are the major theological differences that exist between them and the Western tradition? In what time period? The earlier, the the earliest time period possible. Yeah, that's that's what I thought you were getting at. The West, uh, by which I mean the European aspect of the Roman Empire, uh, basically the around the Mediterranean basin, with the exception of the extreme East. That Western Christian uh, tradition, following mainly the teachings of Paul, as I suggested earlier, developed about three to four centuries later a number of dogmas uh, which were not to be found in the original teachings of Jesus. These include the Trinity, these include incarnation, uh, these include the the perfection of Mary, such that she was without sin as well. A number of these dogmas developed in order to protect Jesus as supposedly the incarnate son of God, uh, eternally existing, but incarnated in flesh in the first century. The Eastern tradition eventually came around to that same view, probably more by pressure than anything else. But in the early going, the Eastern tradition seemed to be more likely to adhere to the Johannine tradition, which was more, you might say, adoptionist, that Jesus was chosen as emissary, as an exponent of what God wanted the world to know, and that he was a human being. Another mighty difference is that you can find this in the letters of Paul, Paul states that Jesus was made of spiritual flesh, spiritual material, and therefore he did not have the same uh, desires that we have, desire to eat, desires for sex, etc., that the rest of us have. Uh, for the Johannine tradition and also in the Eastern tradition early on, Jesus still was essentially human. He had the same appetitive desires that we all have. He was not an exception to this. You find evidence of this, as I suggested earlier, as late as Ephraim the Syrian, other, other, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Ashadad of Merv, earlier writers in Syriac language was another dialect of Aramaic, as late as the fourth, fifth century. But eventually, as I say, they came around to the Western uh, theology of, of incarnation and trinity. We have another super chat from Fire Sabers. Thank you for the twenty dollars. Going back to Mark, you think it was written before the destruction of the temple? Also, a number of scholars hold the opinion that Mark was written by a follower of Paul. Do you think Mark was edited to become more Pauline? No. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. No to the first, yes to the second. It was written, as I suggested earlier, uh, around the same time as John. Uh, John was written between 42 and 68 in the original drafts. Mark, I don't have as firm dates as that, but it seems that Mark was a follower of, of Simon Peter, Simon the Rock. And so he was writing it probably as early as the late 30s, early 40s as well. And uh, it, that would have terminated when he was assassinated in Alexandria, as I mentioned. So around the same time, the destruction of the temple was of course in the year 70. So probably Mark was written before the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 of our common era, as also were the Aramaic drafts of John. As to your second question, John Mark did uh, follow Paul. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, John Mark is originally assigned to go along with uh, Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journeys. But there was that interesting falling out that I mentioned earlier in Crete. If you Crete, if you remember my mentioning how Sergius Paulus evidently inspired Paul to take up his name Paul again. There was a confrontation with uh, a magician who was an assistant to the Roman governor's staff. And as a result of that, uh, Paul no longer felt comfortable with John Mark. John Mark left forcibly uh, 
and they uh, uh, Paul accepted a new student to follow him as the kind of uh, assistant after that time. John Mark, as best as I can put together, went after that time to Ephesus, where he joined together with, with John the Presbyter, and as I said, read those uh, drafts in Aramaic. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, your third question, do you think Mark was edited to become more Pauline? Absolutely. No question about that. The Gospel of Mark, uh, as I said, the canonical version is the second version of the second draft of the Gospel as Mark wrote it, John Mark wrote it, and it was definitely edited, redacted to make it more Pauline, more in confirmation with the dogma that is standard doctrine to this day. Get to the next super chat. Greg Mather, thank you for the $5. Do you think um, let me reread that. Do you see John as part of the circumcision party? Why did he compose Revelation in Aramaic as opposed to Greek? Mm, terrific questions. John was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. For these people, if you wished to follow the traditions, the Jewish traditions, you had two choices. You could become what was known in Greek as a proselyte, proselytos, which was an individual who was fascinated by the Jewish traditions or the Johannine and Christian traditions and followed the Noahide rules, the Noahide laws, which were basically, you might say, Torah light. They said that you couldn't eat uh, flesh cut from a living animal. They said you shouldn't, you shouldn't worship idols. You shouldn't uh, offer, give offerings to them, so on and so forth. These are the Noahide laws as opposed to following all of the laws of the Torah, which of course included circumcision, which might hurt a little bit if you're an adult, which included the kosher rules, the laws of kashrut, etc. So you had two ways you could go. You could join completely and become effectively a Jew, but following the traditions of Jesus, which were wholly a part of the Jewish tradition. The more I find reestablished the original, original version of the Gospel of John and John's other works, the more clearly Jewish they appear to me to be. As to your second question, the revelation like the gospel was composed in Aramaic as opposed to Greek, simply because that was his first language. That was the language he thought in. John the Presbyter was fluent in Greek, but he thought in Aramaic. I live in the country of Panama. My family around me, they're all Panamanians, they speak Spanish. So obviously I speak Spanish fluently. But when I'm thinking, I'm thinking in English. So with two exceptions, all of my books are written in English. And it's the same thing with John. He thought in Aramaic, he wrote in Aramaic. The, the revelation that we have in the New Testament today is, is a translation from the Greek. The Greek, by the way, is the absolute worst Greek you ever want to read. It's horrible Greek. But here's what's fascinating. If you translate the Greek in the of the book of Revelation in the New Testament back into Aramaic, it's actually excellent Aramaic. What happened was whoever translated the Aramaic original into Greek was a little too faithful to the to the Aramaic. He so he took Aramaisms, the order of words, the grammar, the syntax of Aramaic, and put it so literally into Greek that it comes across as absolutely horrible Greek. My cat, who's rubbing my leg, writes better Greek than this. And that is the issue. So I prefer to read the Revelation in the Crawford Codex that I mentioned earlier, which is the only one, the only Aramaic text we have of the Revelation that is not obviously back translated from Greek into Aramaic once again. And it's, no pun intended, a revelation to read that version. Could you um, provide some quick examples of Revelations Greek being horrible? Oh boy. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, one example is in the first chapter, there is a vision of a spiritual figure. And it mentions in the Greek that it's wearing a garment that reaches down to the feet. Uh, this, this is the Greek, but if you go to the Aramaic in the Crawford Codex, it actually says that the figure is wearing the ephod. The ephod, for those of you who are who are expert in the Torah, know, is part of the holy garments, the sacred vestments of the high priest that the high priest wore. It's it's a plate plate like 
garment in two pieces, front and back, uh, tied here at the shoulders and tied also at the sides to hold together. It's wearing an ephod, but it doesn't reach to the feet. That's simply a, a bad translation in the Greek. So that's one that pops in my mind. Got another super chat question. Vesper, thank you for the dollar ninety nine. What's the relation between Mandeans and Johannites? Okay, Man Mandean refers both to a culture and to a religion. The Mandaic language was what they spoke. Most Mandeans, uh, the religious tradition, were followers of John the Mercer, better known in English as John the Baptist, as opposed to Jesus. Uh, they have the Book of John which is not to be confused with the Gospel of John. The Book of John is what they believe are teachings descending directly from John the Mercer, John the Baptist. The relationship with the Johannines is, as I suggested, the Johannine tradition survived much longer in the East than it did in the West. So there was some, some interplay between these two traditions, the Mandaean and the Johannine. Uh, there's a, a German scholar I talk with on occasion who is expert in the Mandaean. and there's also uh, a scholar here in the West, uh, James McGrath, who works with the Mandaean texts as well. And there's a certain amount of interplay between the two that we explore, but they were essentially two different traditions. It makes me curious uh, to ask you, um... Because I know that there are some scholars that say the Mandeans are early, but most will say the Mandeans started very, very late, and they don't actually go back to John the Baptist. When do you think their movement actually sprang into existence? Of course, movements back then were not organized in the modern sense with hierarchies maintaining a control and of course they did not have access to mass communication like we have today so there were local groups that either any of which could have fit into either of those two categories that you mentioned jacob some of them may have been earlier some of them may have been later uh certainly they had certain elements in common but it's hard to say overall whether it was early or late i'm personally of the opinion that the mendeans did have some direct transmission of teachings from John the Immerser that they developed and uh, to some degree amplified over the centuries before they eventually were exterminated. Thank you for the 15 shekels. There isn't really a Hebrew word for baptize. The closest word means dunk. Should we call him John but dunker? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Iran. Very good. <laughs> I love that. Uh, as I said, I, I tend to uh, say John the Immerser, which is maybe a nicer way of saying Dunker. The, uh, yeah, of course, there, every Jew today knows about the mitzvah. If you uh, want to be spiritually pure, we're not talking so much physically cleansed as spiritually cleansed, you go into the mitzvah. And uh, mitzvot are wonderful traditional experience for spiritual cleansing. Uh, but it, uh, it, it's, that is, I'm sorry, mikvah, excuse me. <laughs> the mikvah. Uh, so mitvot, mikvot are a wonderful tradition that we still have to this day uh, in the Jewish tradition. Uh, there was, however, in the time of John the Immerser, something called tevila, which was an immersion, immersion in living water. Uh, Hudra Zoan in Greek, or uh, 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 Mini, uh, I'm having a mind block. Uh, uh, mini, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, living water in Hebrew. I'm sorry, I'm having a mind block. But uh, the immersion in living water of a river, flowing water, was this tradition. John the, the Immerser, or John the Dunker, if you prefer, was doing this in a body of water called the Wadi Kharit at the time that Jesus came to him. This is on the east side of the River Jordan. It's now today in the country of Jordan. And it was in this wadi, very close to the River Jordan itself, that John uh, immersed Jesus. So, yeah, you can call him John the Dunker if you like. The Greek word, by the way, also appears at the Last Supper. When Jesus uh, takes the afikomen, the final bit of food that is supposed to be eaten at Pesach, 
uh, because this night was the Samaritan Pesach. He takes the afikoma, dips it uh, in the mixture of honey and other materials, and gives it to Judah, or in English, Judas, before Judas leaves to make the final arrangements for Jesus' arrest, all with Jesus' permission. Judas was not an enemy. He was helping Jesus in this matter. So, yeah, good question. Paul Kickling, figure to five pounds. Have you read Secret Book of John and Revelation of Paul in the Nag Hammadi? Valentinians revered Paul, while Sethians seemed to revere John. I don't know if it's quite as simple as yes, of course I've read them. Um, and the Valentinians had a complex relationship with Paul. I do not see much in common between the Pauline tradition and the Valentinian tradition. As I suggested, Valentinius saw this world as contingent, as faulted, and the creation of a demiurge, uh, the Sophia Prunicos, if you remember your Carl Gustav Jung, while Paul generally did not. Uh, Valentinius, as a by the way, was apparently nearly elected the Bishop of Rome, in other words, predecessor for the Pope. And I can't help but wonder what would have happened to organized Christianity at least in the West if Valentinius had been elected as quasi-Pope. The Sethians are another matter. Yes, the Sethians, as well as other groups, seem to be much more closely related to the Johannine traditions. Uh, as you probably know, Paul, the Notzrim, in uh, number six, the Notzrim, those who take the vow of the Notzrim, who don't cut their hair, don't uh, take any wine or any wine products, and stay away from dead people and cemeteries in order to fulfill a, a special spiritual vow to God uh, as their commitment to show their faith and grow their faith. Uh, these these uh, followers of this of this tradition, the Notzrim, uh, became in the, the quasi-Christian tradition another group related to the Sethians called the Nazarites. And, and also the Nasenes, N-A-A-S-E-N-E-S. And all these groups, rather amorphous in character, but the Sethians included, were all a part of the, the umbrella of what was more or less Johannine, yes. Thank you for the six Thank you. Thank you, Liran. Malm <laughs> Zorman is running water. Yeah, yeah, Mayim <laughs> Chaim. Thank you. It just sometimes, you'll find out when you're my age, Liran. I can tell you for your picture, you're not quite there. Sometimes the brain just, the synapse doesn't fire. So thank you very much. When you look at the Gnostics and the way they uh, talk about uh, John, the Presbyter, do they attempt to Gnosticize him posthumously to try, try to rewrite him in the same way that Christian literature or pre-Christian literature was rewritten to be Pauline? Hmm. That's an interesting question. As, as I suggested before, Gnosticism was an amorphous movement. It wasn't an organized uh, spiritual tradition in any sense, as what the Joh Johannines or the Paulines. It was simply a kind of a philosophy that pops up here and there in, in various traditions, including Judaism quasi-Christianity as well as pagan, uh, Gentile. So, yes, people generally recast famous figures in recent history and did their best to try to present them as cohering to their to this group's or another group's tra traditional beliefs. So, yes, John was often recast as this or recast as that, uh, including Gnostic groups. Valentinius and John very probably knew each other in Ephesus. There's a delightful story that is told by uh, Ignatius, if memory serves, that they were in a bathhouse together, uh, a, a kind of a, a hot bath, kind of like a Turkish bath, you could say, that they were in the bathhouse. John was in the bath bathhouse and in walked uh, Valentinius. And he said, oh, my goodness, the roof is going to cave in here. There's a heretic among us. They were joking, of course, but... Uh, this kind of, of laughter was a part of their relationship. Paul Kickling, thank you for the five pounds. In the 
chemical wedding of Christian Rosencrantz. He calls Gospel of John the most important and, and the non-embellished passion narrative. Yeah, uh, it does indeed. I, John, the, the Gospel of John, as we have it in the Gospels, among the Gospels today, the canonical Gospels, is quite heavily redacted. I've been spending now just about 50 years trying to get all of these excisions corrected, all of the interpolations removed, and also to restore what I believe is a more appropriate interpretation of what the Gospel is about. The Gospel of John is the most worked over of the four canonical Gospels easily. Uh, yet still, it is the only one that claims to be an eyewitness account and the only one that can actually make a case for being an eyewitness account. And as I suggested earlier, it has two eyewitnesses, John himself, as well as the beloved disciple. Since you say that John's gospel is an eyewitness account, do you, do you, do you, so you do not really think that the gospel of John was copying the other gospels. It was largely, if not entirely, independent. Yes, I do. Okay. So to go back to what you were saying earlier about John and Mark's Gospels, or at least their earlier versions were being written before the destruction of the temple, mm -hmm. you have them being written basically, from what I understand, around the same time as the letters of Paul, because they're dated typically to either, well, some put them in the 40s, a lot of people put them in the 50s, some put them in the 60s. So you think those two Gospels being technically written around the same time as Paul? Yeah, more or less. Absolutely. Yeah, Paul's letters, and I should note for those who aren't familiar, uh, this subject too is a matter of controversy to a degree, but there are certainly some of the letters in the New Testament which are by and large considered by, by my colleagues to be genuinely by Paul, and others that you could say come from the Pauline school. They were written by somebody else and put under Paul's name because back then, if you wanted your work to be successful, you put a famous name in front of it. So uh, there's some question whether some of them are genuine and and uh, at least the genuine ones for sure were written over decades of time. Uh, Paul converted uh, over to join the Christians in the late 30s, if memory serves, and uh, he was uh, removed from the West uh, around the same time that John the Presbyter was arrested and sent to Patmos. Uh, he, by my research, it is only later Christian writers who say he was executed at that time. Paul went to Rome and he apparently appeared before the emperor and apparently was not sentenced to death, but rather exiled. And a number of writers, including Clement, whom we mentioned earlier, who, are, who wrote before those who say that John uh, that Paul was executed, say that he actually went beyond the western gates of the world, which refers, of course, to the Strait of Gibraltar. And uh, beyond the Strait of Gibraltar, he would have gone up the western side, the ocean side of what is now the Iberian Peninsula, past what is now Portugal, and evidently he actually got as far as Britain. There's a number of earlier texts that suggest he was in Britain. And there he finally, very late in life, finally encountered his arch nemesis, the beloved disciple. And they apparently came to a piece it together as best as I could put it together. Fire Sabres, thank you for the $2. In your opinion, who is the beloved disciple? I thought I, thought I gave it away earlier. <laughs> the a beloved disciple, in my view, is Mary, often known as Mary Magdalene. Mary was the, I, I mentioned earlier, Gamaliel, the uh, erstwhile teacher of Paul. Gamaliel, who was the Nasi, the president of the Sanhedrin, an extremely important figure in Jewish history. Uh, Gamaliel's son, uh, Simon the leper, uh, married a woman named Salome, Shalomit in, in Hebrew, and they had a daughter named Mary. A uh, certain amount of material can be put together from the Talmud to document all this. Mary uh, was very unusually for her time, since she was of the female persuasion, highly educated by that grandfather, Gamaliel. She read, wrote, and spoke not only Aramaic, of course, Hebrew, Greek, 
and probably some Latin. There are actually a very few texts that survive that evidently were written by Mary. This, the woman was brilliant, to put it mildly. Her father, let's not leave him out. I mentioned her mother's line going back to Gamaliel Hillel. So she was extremely well connected to an extremely important family in Judea. Her father, by my research, uh, Simon the leper, he was called, uh, evidently was of Tamazight ancestry. He was from uh, North Africa. He was part of a tradition, uh, uh, sorry, a people often known in English as the Berbers. Uh, and he was, uh, as an African, descended apparently from the nobility of what today we call Ethiopia, descended of the Queen of Sheba, uh, who you may remember was involved with Solomon, the last of the kings of the United Israel. And uh, she is known in, in uh, Ethi amongst the Ethiopian people as Makeda. If you read the Keber Nagas, the great epic poem of Ethiopia, it tells the story of, of uh, the Queen of Sheba and uh, Solomon in quite a lot of detail. Mary was descended from this noble people on her father's side, she also had descent from the uh, house of David on her mother's side. So here she is from two royal families, a well-connected family, Hillel and Gamaliel. Uh, she was obviously part of the uh, school of Pharisees that followed the teachings of Hillel and Gamaliel as opposed to the Shammai school. The woman was extremely well-educated. She was a suitable match for somebody who might possibly have been recognized as the uh, pretender to the Davidic throne, which apparently, according to the Talmud, amongst other sources, Jesus was. So they were, as they say today, a power couple, an amazing pair of people with uh, much authority. Some people think Jesus coming from Galilee was disrespected, thought as just a country bumpkin. Evidently not, especially if he was involved with someone like Mary, who was so astonishingly well-connected. So in this case, you think that Mary Magdalene was alive for a while, well after Jesus's crucifixion. Correct. Yeah. Paul Kickling, figure of five pounds. Can you talk about Christ's favorite three apostles? One was John, one his uh, brother, three times 14 equals 12. The uh, 12 in singularity Christ, a four level hierarchy, it seems. Okay. Paul, thank you for the five pounds again. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would say Jesus had favorite three departments. Just as a, by the way, I don't call him Christ. Christ was not his name. Uh, those who say Jesus H. Christ, if it was his last name, are really uh, mistaken. Christ was a cognomen, which was applied to him. Christos in Greek, Mashiach in Hebrew. He was considered by many, including John, to be the expected Mashiach, the expected Messiah. Uh, so I, I refer to him, if you don't mind, as Jesus, or if you want, in, in uh, Aramaic, Ashwe. He also treated his students, I think, with fairness and equality. He did not uh, necessarily separate any out as special. The uh, Gospels of, uh, well, Gospel of Matthew in particular has the story of taking John and James and Simon, the rock, or Peter, up into a mountain at which time Jesus was transfigured before them. That doesn't mean that they were his favorites. That just means that they were the ones who accompanied him. They weren't necessarily all all the apostles together all the time. They would have a special assignments uh, to take care of. So we can't assume from that that they were special. But you are right that John, the uh, John, the son of Zebedee, and his brother James were certainly. Uh, uh, part of this company of disciples. They were relatively young. They were part of the crew that manned the fishing boats uh, in what you might call a company uh, of fish wholesaling operating out of Capernaum that was overseen by Simon the Rock or, or Peter. So they all had their roles, their special responsibilities among the disciples. And Jesus, I really think, treated them all pretty equal. Well, my final question for you today is when you look at the rest of these sources besides Thomas, 
do you see the other Gospels besides John as also being reliable? Or do you think the other Gospels besides John and Thomas have created more fiction than truth? Oh, it, I don't know if I would put it quite as an either or fiction or truth. They all are trying to represent truth according to their own personal lights, the lights of the authors. They're not trying to invent anything I don't believe. I think they're honestly trying to depict Jesus as they understood him to be, his nature and his teachings. So for them, it was truth. Truth, of course, for any of us human beings, you and me and the rest of the species, truth is subjective. It is, if you remember your, your philosopher, the English philosopher, George Barclay, for, for example, objective knowledge is not possible for those of us who live in finite brains with only limited perspectives on the world around us. Uh, we have an asymptotic relationship with the objective truth. We can strive for it, but we can never reach it. George Barclay went on to say there's only, by logic, only the being that is capable of objective truth has to be a priority god only god has that objective truth so for us human beings we write gospels i i'm not saying i do but but they wrote gospels that represented as best as they could the truth as they knew it for me the historical jesus as a living historic figure is best represented by the earlier gospels that i mentioned the the aramaic version of john the uh the secret gospel of mark the gospel of philip and elements in especially Matthew, but also Luke to a degree. So one learns to look at these with care and see if one can find a common thread from the earlier traditions as well in the later Gospels like Matthew and Luke. Paul Kickling, thank you for the five pounds. Magdalene is Christ's consort, which has shown up in all places, in mysticism, Krishna, Radha, Adam, Eve, Abram, Sarah, wife of the solar deity, etc. Oh, yeah. No, it, I'm going to assume, Paul, that you're familiar with Carl Gustav Jung. This is an archetype. There's no question about it. The Jesus Mary relationship, that power couple, pardon the phrase, that they clearly were, is archetypical. If you think of the meeting between Jesus and Mary at the spring, by the way, the the Greek and the Aramaic words both don't mean well, but spring, the, the spring of Jacob in Samaria. This meeting is directly parallel to the meeting of many of the patriarchs with their future wives, Moses and Jacob and so on. All of them, they met their, their spouses to be at a well. And Ephraim the Syrian, in fact, makes a great deal out of this, drawing the parallel between the meeting of the meetings of the patriarchs in Genesis with their future wives and the meeting of Jesus and Mary at the spring in Samaria. Well, thanks for joining me today, uh, Dr. Arlene. It's uh, been a pleasure having you here and I'd like to have you back at some point. Sure, be a pleasure. And I thank all, uh, all the people that super chatted and I thank all who participated in the live chat. I appreciate the audience for their continued support. And I will see all of you later. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream.